Now, I, look, it's undeniable. Parental choice has an allure. We all like to feel as if we're in meaning control of important decisions <coughs> affecting our lives. Uh, especially if we're being fed this incessant diet of how terrible the public schools are, how malevolent and self-interested teachers and their organizations are, and how wonderful charter and private schools are. It, it would defy human nature if parents weren't tempted by the prospect of, oh, somebody's going to give me public money to opt out of this horrible situation, which I'm told either my child is in or children generally are. Um, now, I mean, this is a debate for another day. The, what is it that brought together this odd uh, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative coalition uh, around this vision that public schools are awful and charter schools are wonderful. I will only say everything we know systematically about both those assertions suggests they're dead wrong, that public schools actually are quite good, although certainly they can be improved. And the Gallup poll suggests that parents, when they're asked, well, how's your child's public school, agree with that, that they're good and not bad. Um, as to the charter schools, there's the latest and, and most substantial study that came out of the Hoover Institute at Stanford, hardly a hotbed of progressivism, um, concluded that 17% of charter schools outperform public schools with the same students. 37% of charter schools underperform public schools with the same students. So the headline could be, couldn't it? Charter schools are more than twice as bad as public schools. That's not the headline we read. Now. What we read are charter schools are wonderful and public schools are terrible. And uh, Jeffrey Canada at the Harlem Children's Zone is Superman. Uh, well, Superman earns $515,000 a year from the Harlem Children's Zone, so that's, that's pretty super. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, let me get local to our governor who was here last night, uh, Chris Christie. He's proposed substantial loosening of New Jersey's charter school. What does he propose? He proposed that instead of just the State Department of Education being able to charter uh, schools, we should listen up, we should have multiple charters, and, and in fact one he mentioned was Rutgers as the issuer of charters. He also proposed that charter schools should be operated by for-profit companies, currently it's only non-profit companies. Third, he argued that, and proposes, that charter schools should be operated by religiously affiliated organizations, which is not currently permitted. The governor also supports the Opportunity Scholarship Act, New Jersey's version of the voucher, and he said it's a first step toward a statewide publicly funded voucher program. And, and this is done at the same time as he's just got about a billion dollars out of uh, public state funding of public schools, um, and the issue of whether that renders our school funding statute unconstitutional is uh, before our New Jersey Supreme Court as we speak. Um, let me just suggest a few things, um, one last contextual factor, and then I want to at least get a little bit into a, a bit deeper look at the impact. Um, and that's the nature of vouchers and tax credits, and if, if you'll excuse my uh, using this expression, like with so many things, the devil is in the details. Um, because the voucher idea, I mean, it actually is earlier, but Milton Friedman uh, in 1952 argued we should privatize education by using vouchers and that the market will do a better job uh, than the government can do. Uh, and that led to a lot of people castigating public schools as quote government schools. Uh, I'm reminded about the story about uh, uh, University of Chicago law professors and the question of how many of them does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> uh, and the answer is none, the market will take care of it. <laughs> so I think there is this mythology out there that the market will take care of everything. We can just sit back and be the beneficiaries of it. Um, I actually was talking with the Comer a little earlier. I was involved in a 1970 voucher that very few people know about. He does, so we're 
rare company, but it was um, a voucher program announced by the Federal Office of Economic Opportunity, the federal government's anti-poverty agency. And it was a program called a regulated compensatory voucher, uh, which meant it was going to be strictly regulated. It was going to be policed by a public agency to ensure that proper information was made available to parents, that proper choice and application mechanisms <coughs> were adhered to. And the compensatory part was interesting. It was to the effect that more needy, more educationally needy students would get larger vouchers than educationally advantaged students. Uh, for a lot of reasons, I, I worked actually with the Trenton School District, which had some interest in it. Not a single school district in the country accepted federal money. And what emerged, uh, for those of you who follow such things, was Alum Rock, California, sort of improvising on magnet schools within its own district. And that was the closest we came to that. Um, but uh, obviously, the Milwaukee and Cleveland voucher program, the DCs and Florida's, uh, followed a, a different model. Um, one interesting comparison, when the OEO program was being proposed in 1970, the overwhelming prevailing wisdom was parochial schools could not constitutionally be included in such a program. Obviously, that shifted, and Zellman said the shift is likely to be for good. Um, the current versions are, as I've suggested, not called voucher programs at all, but tax credit and uh, tax deduction programs, it seems to me, in my, uh, I didn't go to the University of Chicago, so I don't have sophisticated economic knowledge, but it seems to me a dollar for dollar tax credit has exactly the same economic effect as a direct grant of federal money, but the technicalities of that are apparently hotly at issue in the, in, in the Arizona um, uh, case before the Supreme Court. So let me just start, I know I'm going to run out of time. Um, but I have seven more minutes, so don't give up hope. Um, with a little deeper look at the impact um, of vouchers on urban education. And I really want to make two points, and I, I probably won't even be able to get through the first one. But point one is, what's the real status of urban education? Because whenever you're considering a reform, vouchers, charter schools, uh, merit pay for teachers, any other reform you care to mention, it seems to me you evaluate it in large part on the basis of a question of compared to what? You know, what are we trying to reform and why do we feel such an imperative to reform it? And if the answer is, well, you know, actually what we have when you look at it fairly is pretty good, it can sort of minimize or undermine your desire or commitment to engage in a, in a kind of thoroughgoing reform. So uh, let me just say a couple quick things about the real status of public schools. Um, we need get, to get beyond celebrity sound bites and the multi-million dollar film on foot. Uh, if we're waiting for Superman or believing in his redemptive powers because of the supposed horrors of Metropolis, uh, we're really in big trouble. So let, let me start, and I'll come back to it. And, 20 minutes, um, to say that, and, and it won't surprise you, uh, Abbott against Burke has been something I've worked on and its predecessor for 40 years. And, and I think Abbott has fundamentally reshaped the public education scene in New Jersey in ways that probably a lot of you don't realize, and for sure in ways that people around the rest of the country uh, don't even begin to understand. because. The prevailing idea, accurate in other places, is that one of the big problems with urban schools is they're dreadfully underfunded. Uh, they take the most difficult and expensive to educate students, and they have the least resources to do that. That was decidedly the case in New Jersey in the 1960s. And it continued to a lesser degree to be the case until 1998. In 1998, Abbott took full hold, and it has provided more money in urban school districts in New Jersey than in most of the suburban school districts in New Jersey, and more money by probably close to a multiple of two than most other school districts, urban or suburban, in the rest of the country have. We're talking about 
15 to 17 thousand dollars per student. And, and most states, when I when I speak elsewhere, look at me like, did you come in from Mars or Pluto? I mean, nobody has that kind of money invested in public schools. We have in New Jersey, and there was a recent University of Michigan study that said, you know what? The money on the whole actually is being well spent. Somebody took the pains to track the money to look how it's being spent. Um, and there's less money going to administration in urban public schools in New Jersey than is going to administration in charter schools. So we talk about money getting to the classroom. Um, I don't know whether we're out. I will pick up the theme because I want to uh, amplify a bit on the good things that are happening unbeknownst to, to the world at large in urban education, at least in New Jersey, and against that backdrop say, well, what can vouchers bring to the table? Is there anything positive they can bring? Conversely, are there negative things that we could expect from vouchers? So I will uh, reserve my seven minutes. <laughs> Sort of one of the behind. 